This is Colonia Cast, episode 27. Thanks for joining us. You can find us at the turtleroom.org slash Colonia Cast, where you can find a link to the channel on access to the Colonia Cast Student Research Fund, where we'll be raising money for uh, student research projects. Uh, today, we're joined by Dr. Michael Graziano, uh, who is a assistant professor of biological sciences at Bridgewater State University in Massachusetts. Um, Dr. Graziano got his master's studying the smallmouth salamander uh, at, number, at University of Nebraska. Uh, he then went on to do his PhD work at the Ohio State University, uh, studying sort of herpetological community changes uh, with respects to multiple different uh, sort of ecological influences. Uh, we're really excited to talk to him about some of his work and some of the turtle work that he's doing. So uh, Dr. Graziano, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, so can we kind of start off with a similar question every time just to kind of get to know our uh, guests a bit, but um, maybe you can shed some light on how you got interested in turtles. I know we spoke a little yesterday and and uh, I was, I didn't realize that you had some, some familiarity with the Western pond turtles, but uh, Maybe you could just tell us kind of how did you get interested in, in turtles and reptiles in general? Uh, oh, boy. Um, yeah, so I, you're being generous by saying I have a familiarity with Western pond turtles because I never managed to see them. I looked for them um, when I was a kid, but I never actually succeeded in finding them. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I just, I've been in, interested in just turtles and um, reptiles and amphibians for as long as I can remember. Um, I mean, honestly, yeah, as long as I can remember. Uh, one of my very first books um, was that little Audubon field guide, the one that's green and kind of has that faux leather exterior. And the one, the edition that I had, had a green tree frog on the front. Um, and I just, I mean, I think I got that when I was seven years old. Um, <laughs> and I just, read every entry in there and I just stared at the pictures because this is before the internet and so if I wanted to see pictures of turtles and just cool animals I had to find a book to do it uh, so you know going to the library or yeah that Audubon field guide I just looked at I I could probably draw not well but I could draw most of the pictures of almost any herp in that book from memory um, and then you know I spent my summers uh, on my grandparents' farm in Southwest Ohio. And, uh, you know, I'd always just, you know, in the mornings I'd get up and I'd go down to the creek and look for turtles. I always, you know, the Holy Grail was finding a box turtle and, you know, just enjoying those. Um, but I also, you know, I, I remember just sitting on the bank of, of their creek once and um, I was probably, I don't know, eight or 10 years old. And I was actually just, just playing around. I was taking some of the mud and sand and just making little, little forts. And uh, as I was digging, I hit something. I was like, what is this? And I started kind of uncovering it. And it was a soft shell turtle that was buried in, in the mud. Uh, and, the, and so I was just, it was the, it was my first one I'd ever seen. And it was just, it was so crazy because, you know, this is a Creek I've been going to my whole life. And granted I was only you know 10 years old or something, but um, but it was just so weird. I was just sitting there, just, I was kind of bored. It was a summer day and I was sitting there just, plopping mud into a pile like kids do. And, um, and then it was like, what, what is this weird thing that I'm touching? And it was a soft shell turtle. So, I mean, yeah, as long as I can remember. Um, and my parents, especially my mom was uh, very supportive and uh, taking me to every nature park within, you know, an hour or more radius of where we lived to be at Ohio or Illinois or California or South Carolina until I could myself or my friends could start driving. So yeah, as, as long as I can remember, but turtles have always been the one that was really special. They've never, they've never wavered in terms of how much I'm, in terms of my fondness for them. Right, that's an interesting story, especially the soft shell encounter. I feel like as a kid, that's something that could, that could really be kind of a, a positive experience and, and seeing a, a trionychid. But um, so you've done some some work with a variety of turtles. Um, the spotted turtles uh, was one that that definitely I've seen a lot of your social media posts and such about. 
Uh, but maybe you could tell us a bit more about some of the work you're doing with spotted turtles and, and uh, yeah, just. Uh, yeah. Um, so I love spotted turtles. I just, I mean, granted they're, they're, they're an easy animal to love just based off of everything about them. Um, and, you know, growing up in Ohio, I, and, you know, and I moved, I lived in South Carolina for a bit as well. And I, Ohio, especially though, I, I looked for them all the time. That was something I was, when I was a kid and I'd go looking for them and never found them. Um, and it's something that I, whenever I could find any bit of information on them, any book, any excerpt, I just, I just grabbed it. And, um, and I just, you know, just memorized every bit of it. And I remember one of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite books, um, that just really got me just in love with spotted turtles. Um, it's, there's a writer named David Carroll. Uh, he wrote, uh, he's written a few books. Um, uh, one of his books is called the year of the turtle and it's got a pair of spotted turtles on in the front of it. Um, and he does his own artwork. And the other book he has is called uh, Swamp Walker's Journal. And basically his, his, his books um, are his uh, kind of, it's almost like it's a, it's a well narrated journal of his outing looking for all these animals, uh, you know, spotted turtles and wood turtles and whatnot. And so I really got into spotted turtles when I was reading those books in, in middle and high school. Um, and so, you know, I, I never really got, I, I saw them here and there, um, you know, in Ohio and in the Carolinas and elsewhere. Um, but when I moved to New England, um, I got the opportunity to work with them. Um, I am, yeah, as you mentioned, I'm at Bridgewater State University and, um, and that this, the kind of the region, the coastal region or just, you know, of, of Massachusetts, um, is, is surprise there still are surprisingly robust populations despite urban sprawl um and you know other stressors um and so yeah with another professor uh at the university we kind of decided just to just to you know see what's going on with them because we we've got easy access to some populations and it just seemed you know it was just it was too good of a thing to pass up what's funny is that is that a lot of people don't really seem to pay them much attention. Um, and so that made it even more interesting for me. So um, so I started up with kind of just going out and, and just seeing whereabouts they were, um, you know, um, that I could easily access. And um, that allowed me to then go, uh, go forward with some, you know, some hypotheses and, um, and, that I, that I would, I would, I would like to, you know, to test, um, and experiment with. And so, um, I'm looking at mostly populations or a population that's in a suburban area. Um, it's, it is quite fragmented. Um, I mean, there's a lot of roads and, um, and it's new England. So people drive <laughs> those roads have a lot of traffic and the people, uh, right. drive interesting uh <laughs> um so they're, they're, they are fragmented uh but oddly there again there are still some surprisingly robust populations um and i do have some other sites that i that i uh monitor um that are in more uh rural settings so yeah so i've just i've been uh going out there uh since 2018 I believe, yeah, 2018, um, moved there in 2017. And, and, you know, I, I talked to a couple of, a couple of the other professors in the department and they, you know, they told me that, oh yeah, I find spotted turtles over here, over here. And I was like, that's okay. That's pretty cool. And so, um, yeah, I followed up with it. I found a, a number of, of sites and, um, decided to kind of work on them a bit more intensely. Well, that, that's cool that you've got sort of, it sounds like a variety of different kind of habitats that you're, you're assessing, right? The more urban sort of fragmented habitats, and then you said more kind of rural. So I right. imagine you get kind of good comparative data. Yeah. Right. So what kind of data are you taking? Um, so it's, it's largely, so with regards to the turtles themselves, it's, you know, your basic morphometric data. Um, 
so carapace length and plastron length, um, mass, um, and then, um, you know, making note of any injuries with regards to them as well. Um, and since, you know, I, you know, I, I've, I've, I've used uh, pit tags to mark, you know, snakes and other things. I just, um, I'm just not terribly comfortable with spotted turtles doing it. It's, you know, I, I, it's weird. I am, you know, I've utilized a uh, visible implant elastomer that you, you load it up into an insulin syringe and I've injected red back salamanders, which are just a couple of salaman- a couple of inches long. I've even injected, used it to mark, um, uh, salamander and tadpole or salamander larvae and, and tadpoles. So I'm, I'm comfortable marking small things, but with regards to the turtles, I don't, I just don't feel comfortable, you know, putting a pit tag in them. So we haven't used that. Uh, what we're actually doing is we're taking plastron shots uh, of all the individuals. And so um, there's a number of reasons why I like doing this is that for one, it's not invasive. Um, I don't have to worry about, um, you know, the albeit small possibility of an infection setting in um, with, with the pit tag um, injection. I also um, uh, like utilizing these, these photos of their plastron uh, because it's, it's more openly available data. Um, so I have students who work with us. I, I, you know, each, each year I have a few students who've been helping us out. And, um, and we have all of the spotted turtles we've got on record. We have their, a, a plastron shot of them and a carapace just as a backup. And um, with regards to using pit tags, um, in order to identify the turtle, you need to have a pit tag scanner. And those scanners can cost hundreds of dollars, um, you know, five, six, seven hundred dollars. And if, you know, let's just say that Tim is helping me out on Monday, it's supposed to help me out on Monday, but it ends up being sick. And so, you know, now Lucy's going to pick up the slack and help out on Monday. Well, Tim has a pit tag scanner and he's at home. And so how, how, you know, that it, it, that right there makes the work, you know, impossible. So, um, so by using these plastron photos, um, I can share the, the, that imagery with all the students who are helping on the project. And when they find an animal, they can go through um, the database and you know match the photos up. And they always take a picture just to be on the safe side um, that they're identifying it correctly. But I have not had a single student misidentify a single animal um and you know in the three i the first year i kind of it was me and this other professor who worked on it on our own but the last three years we've had students helping us we have not had a single student misidentify a single animal uh the population we we have um around 100 turtles individuals in this population that we've marked so far or identified and um and not a single student misidentified one and they're actually pretty quick with, with regards to identifying the individuals um, they can, um, you know, scrolling through the, you know, Google Drive to see the images, they can usually identify the animal within, you know, a minute maximum. Um, so that's, that's, that's pretty, I think that's a, that's a pretty um, powerful way, tool uh, to use for marking large numbers of animals. Um, as for shell notching, uh, we haven't, we, you know, we, we haven't done that um, yet. Um, we, we could, and it's something that, you know, if, 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 if our permits allow, um, I wouldn't mind uh, notching shells in the future, um, just to make it a little bit more quickly obvious that, that it's an animal that we have ca- captured already. Um, but, but yeah, right now the, you know, the, the plastron photos are, are really, really valuable. Um, as for other data we're taking down, um, we're looking at, you know, maximum water depth. We're looking at, at the um, fluctuations in water level as well for the different sites. So in other words, uh, across the year, how much do they fluctuate? Is it something that's, that's truly ephemeral? Does it dry up entirely? Is it, is it perennial? Um, is it a, you know, is it a permanent pond that could potentially sustain fish? Um, or is it somewhere in between? So we're looking at the hydro periods of the different wetlands. We're also looking at canopy openness as well, which is a really, pro- which is typically a, a pretty, uh important um pretty significant variable when you're doing any kind of herb work um especially with regards to wetlands 
uh, canopy openness can be a really, is often a significant variable to be looking at because they still have to thermoregulate. And if you have a completely closed canopy pond where very little sunlight is reaching them, if the water is going to be colder, your primary productivity is going to be less. And because primary productivity is less, then you have a, you know, a more depauperate amphibian and macroinvertebrate population, which means less food for turtles. So, um, so canopy openness is a really powerful one. Um, other data we are taking down, um, distance um, to impervious surfaces, in other words, roads or parking lots. Um, and let's see here, um, pH and conductivity, um, temperature just fluctuates so much, it's really not that, it's just, it's not that helpful. Um, and then also we're, we're also assessing, uh, uh, simultaneously we're assessing the macroinvertebrate community and the, and the amphibian community. So we're kind of looking at it holistically. We're not just focused on the turtles themselves. We're, we're looking at the macroinverts and we're looking at the uh, amphibians as well. So I think that was a really long answer for what could have been much shorter, sorry. No, I mean, I, I think it's great, really thorough. Um, I, I, about the canopy openness, I, uh, I've done some pond turtle work and we did not really, I, I mean, pond turtles are more in kind of like uh, lodic systems. So there's not really a closed canopy or the potential mm -hmm. for it even. But uh, I've looked at like vegetation cover and that sort of thing as a proxy for disturbance. But I'm curious, mm -hmm. what, what do you think uh, are some of the impacts that a closed canopy versus open canopy are going to be having on the turtles and uh yeah so um in terms of you know the impacts of a closed canopy system versus an open canopy system especially in these lentic systems these you know vernal pools and and, and small ponds um so unlike lodic systems like what you worked with and lodic systems um you have not only primary productivity um from you know algae um and whatnot, but you also have this aloxinous input from flooding that gets put into these systems. And so that can really help sustain a, um, you know, a, a food web essentially in that stream. In a vernal pool and in these small wetlands, they don't have that luxury. And so uh, their, um, their primary, you know, their, their, the base of that system comes from the immediately the immediate surrounding trees so in other words what trees are within you know 50 plus meters ish of that pond whatever those trees are dropping into the vernal pool which can again form a base for certain macroinvertebrates fungi bacteria uh, but also the canopy openness which allows um for al um, algal growth which is important for you know it it uh generates paraphyton which is what uh tadpoles require and a lot of macroinvertebrates um, and then that allows salamanders to come in and, and feed on those. So uh, closed canopies, uh, closed canopy systems in terms of how they, how they impact turtles, um, at least, at least on, a, on a longer term, they're going to limit their ability to um, thermoregulate. So closed canopy means less sun, which means lower temperatures typically. Um, also, it, tip it also typically means, interestingly, uh, lower dissolved oxygen levels um so, which might seem somewhat odd because you have colder you know cooler water but that said um because you have cooler water um and because you have that close canopy you don't have the algae that are kind of increasing the dissolved oxygen in those ponds and as a result you have bacterial and fungal growth which actually kind of tends to sap um uh, dissolved oxygen out of those waters so you have lower do levels um cooler temperatures and then just less of a food base for these turtles um to, to really forage on. And so will they use closed canopy? Will they use closed canopy uh, uh, wetlands, vernal pools? Absol they absolutely will. Um, but it's not what I would, I hate to say this, um, cause I, you know, I, but I, it's not what I would consider to be, you won't find, it would, I would be hard pressed to argue that you'd have a closed canopy wetland that serves as critical habitat for a population of spotted turtles. In other words, um, if that is that, if, if a closed canopy wetland is where they really center a lot of their activity around, um, well, I, I would have a hard time arguing that that would be tenable in the long term for them because it, it is limiting uh, in a number of ways from, you know, everything from thermoregulation to, 
to foraging. Um, whereas open canopy, you know, open canopy uh, removes those stressors. It allows for more thermoregulatory activity. Uh, it, it typically, you know, allow, uh, creates a, a, a greater foraging base for them. So, and you find that with amphibians too, by the way. Um, it's always, you know, there's a good way of kind of, it, it's a, it's a, a very generalistic way of looking at some of these wetlands. But when I do a lot of my amphibian work, um, if I come to a wetland and I see button bush growing in or adjacent to that wetland, to that vernal pool, button bush is a very um, shade intolerant plant. And so if there's button bush growing there, I know that it's getting enough sun. To, if I know if it's getting enough sun to grow button bush, then typically that's a good enough pool to sustain a pretty um, rich and diverse amphibian community, which then would translate at least up to turtles as well, eventually. But yeah, so it's show, they've shown it with a lot of other animals. Uh, macroinvertebrates are another one. They found that macroinvertebrate communities are typically richer in open canopy pools versus closed canopy pools. So it just makes sense that the, that the turtles would, would favor those wetlands. That that's really interesting. Jack actually has some experience with spotted turtles. I know that are in some ways, it seems like uh, maybe he can speak to this a bit more, but maybe not as healthy as other populations. I don't know the canopy there at, at, at that area. What is that like? Or what do you think is going on more for Jack? Oh, uh, well, yeah. So there's a, well, there's a wastewater treatment plant that's like a couple miles from my house and it seems to be spewing like Women or something into a series of vernal pools, but they're all they're really the kind of like there's, there's not really a lot of access to some like there, and uh, there's a small number of spotted turtles in that pool. Uh, I don't know how many the state has there. It's really low, and they all look, they're all doing poorly. They have really bad, like it almost looks like a fungal infection over their carapace, and uh, and sometimes they're just lethargic. Some look like they're dying. Like they really don't seem to be doing well there. Uh, compared to the other sites where the, the canopy is open and they're not getting, they're not near that, that way, working plan or anything like that, and uh, they seem to be doing really, really good. So, like, I was going to ask that in terms of like uh, anthropogenic threats, like what, how do you get any kind of like effluent or anything coming into these sites that would affect the turtles, or uh, is it more direct, like just road mortality and things like that? Uh, that's a great question. So, so I think so. You're, you're asking is is have I noticed that that um, in other words, like kind of a pollution from adjacent areas, effluent from uh, from you know, yeah wastewater treatment plants or whatnot. Have I noticed that that has much of an impact on on them in at my areas? Is that is that the question? Yeah, yeah. I think so. Um, uh, that, that is a good question. So I will say one thing I will say is that, um, you know, like, like all things, they have limits, but I, I, I have found uh, spotted in some pretty degraded um, sites that seems to be doing quite well. Now that said, is this something that's like kind of kind of a legacy where it might they might be slowly declining and I just am not able to pick that up. It's, it's quite possible. Uh, but that said, um, at my sites, there, one of my one of my pools, um, actually, I'm sorry, two of my pools uh, that I that I've I've documented spotted turtles in are immediately adjacent to a parking lot, um, to a large parking lot, and in New England we have snow, and that means we put tons of salt down on our roads, and these parking lots put massive amounts of of salt on them, and um, um, one of you know a nickname that actually my students and I have for for, um, uh, for one of the ponds is called the dead pond uh, because it does occasionally spot of turtles get in there or it will utilize it but not for terribly long and then we have another one that we call the salt pond where the conductivity is just literally off the charts because of, I mean this spring when we were working on it there was literally a pile of salt that had not been spread across the parking lot and was just sitting there through May. Uh, just, I mean, just a pile, probably two feet tall of salt. And whenever it rained, it just flowed into that pool. And it seemed worse this year. So this one pond where, I'm sorry, two ponds where I typically do find a few individuals each year, um, I found none in this year. 
Um, and I did not find them elsewhere, which concerns me a little bit. Um, I'm not sure necessarily from the effluent, but also, but maybe potentially from more town. I'm not really attached to a parking lot. Uh, but I did notice that this year, this is the first year I did not record any, any spotted turtles in either of those two ponds. Usually a few of them will use it for a little while, uh, but this year none did. Um, so I, I do think that that long term, I think that that would certainly have some impacts on them. I mean, just like anything, um, you know, they, you know, long term exposure to high levels of, of pollutants can certainly um, impact, you know, fecundity or robusticity of an individual. So, yeah, it, it you know, I, I think that I think they're more I do think that they are more tolerant um, than we might give them credit for, but that said, everything has a limit. And it seems like nowadays, with regards to anthropogenic influences, that limit has been met or exceeded in most areas. So, yeah. <laughs> Does that sort of answer your question? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah, well, I'm, uh, oh, I'm I mean, sorry? That, that's interesting and yeah, sort of... My, my connection's cutting out a little bit here and there. Oh. Come through. Yeah, sometimes the virtual nature of things gets a bit challenging, but we work with it. Yeah, uh, I, yeah I mean, it, one thing I'm curious, I, one thing I'm curious about too is talking about like urban centers. It seems like some of the populations are not doing great. Uh, based on that the kind of the, that the sort of disturbance there but you mentioned some of them are doing surprisingly well and i'm curious yeah. if you have any sort of data working in kind of the northeast on baseline or historic abundances like uh maybe even to get an idea of carrying capacity of turtles is something that it surprisingly little is out there about but understanding historical abundance might give you an idea yeah okay so um Let's see if I can untangle, if I can kind of go piece by piece with that. So first, with regards to carrying capacity um, for turtles, um, you know, it's something that's mentioned a lot. You know, I, I hear people talk about carrying capacity with regards to snapping turtles, you know, people who are concerned about them being overpopulated and all that stuff. And it just, with regards to carrying capacity for kind of a mid-level consumer, um, you know, a, a low or mid-level consumer like turtles, um, I... I, I would be in the camp. I, I would argue that that they are not regulated as much by can by by, by uh, carrying capacity. Um, I would I would be shocked if there are many populations that actually meet uh, carrying capacity um, as a result of just I mean various factors from anthropogenic influences to natural influences. Just you know, um, uh, a lot of turtles are, are aggressive. I mean, male male wood turtles will just destroy another male if they get anywhere near them. They'll chase them off. I mean, that that's going to cause them to, you know, move farther away. So I would say that carrying capacity um, is something for a mid-level consumer like 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 a turtle, something that has you know really low reproductive rate. Um, I would argue that they would that, that carrying capacity for them has never really been an issue. Um, and then as for historic versus current abundance, um, you know, it, it's kind of, it's sad because from what you can read about spotted turtles and um, especially spotted, but you can also find you can also find historical uh, anecdotal accounts about wood turtles as well. Um, they were among the most abundant turtles in across much of their range. Um, I mean, there are accounts from even as late as the 1950s where people would say that spotted outnumbered. Uh, painted turtles in some areas, um, and I, there's uh, a spot that I, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on the on the on the place right now. But um, I think it, it was somewhere in New England where it was where this one uh, researcher was saying how the, uh, historical accounts recorded wood turtles as being the most common turtle that was seen in the in the region. Um, maybe sec maybe a close second to painted turtles, um, which is is insane to think about that really to think of wood turtles being around is being as abundant as a painted turtle um but it's even you know and and but spotted turtles in terms of their current versus historical 
Uh, yeah, they were historically very abundant. I mean, I mean you look back at it, it reports um, in anecdotally going across their range, they were incredibly abundant. Um, equal to more than or just slightly less than uh, painted. Um, that goes for even, you know, where I'm from in Ohio as well. They were, um, you know, they were abundant in the, in, within their range in the state. Um, and as for current, you know, it, it's obviously much more depleted than it, than it was historically as a result of a number of factors. Uh, but the thing that I'm curious about, the thing that kind of has me sort of at a loss, I, I've tossed a lot of hypotheses around, um, but you know, they're, they're still doing pretty well that you still can find robust populations in coastal regions, um, you know, from the Carolinas northward. And what we've seen in a lot of other areas is, you know, you have higher, when you have more people and more roads, you typically have fewer turtles because they're getting, you know, run over and whatnot. Then you have collection and all these other things happening. But it's odd to me that these coastal regions, which are the most densely populated, uh, and these coastal regions, which also have been populated the longest by people. This is I mean, when, 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 when Europeans colonized the US, you know, they hit the Atlantic coast first. And, those, and so these are the oldest cities as well. And it, you would think that, that the Atlantic coast is where they might actually have disappeared from first because of just the, the, the long duration they've been exposed to people. Um, but it, oddly, they seem to be, you know, again, some of the most robust populations of these coastal regions. Um, and I don't, I don't really know why, honestly. I would like to kind of know why. I think if that was a, if that was a model that we could figure out, we could maybe try and replicate it farther west in their range where they're not doing as well. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know why. I mean, it's, it's something, it could be as simple as there were just a, a ton of spotted turtles on the Atlantic coast. And despite our, despite humans' best efforts, they haven't, you know, entirely removed them from the Atlantic coast because they're just historically were so many that their populations ha have been able to sustain themselves. Is that, is that something that can be, um, that could withstand, you know, future pressures? I, I don't know. Um, I, I hope so, but I, it's hard to be optimistic and it's hard to be optimistic about a lot of things uh, ecologically right now. But I, I, there's a part of me that thinks maybe there are just so many to begin with that they've just they've been able to maintain their populations in certain areas in ways that other populations weren't able to. So um, I will say one thing that I think is interesting uh, with regards, and this is this is a hypothesis that I, I I'm trying to figure out how to. It, I don't know even how I go about getting the data necessary to try and to try and test this. But the uh, New England, um, coastal New England had a, and I, st I still think it does have, I'm not, I'm not positive, I, I don't do any mammal work out here, but uh, has had um, in the last, I think 20 years, I want, I think, I want to say starting in the, like the late 90s or early 2000s, there was a huge rabies outbreak in the region. And it, it really hit raccoon and skunk populations, um, as well as uh, foxes. Uh, it, it hit them hard. It severely depleted their population. And when I say severely depleted, it's possible it just took them down to what historical levels could have been. I mean, it's, it's possible. Um, I mean, raccoons and skunks, foxes, those are all what we refer to as these, you know, subsidized um, mesopredators. In other words, these are organisms that they do better alongside humans than they do in rural areas. You'll find more skunks, foxes, and uh, and raccoons per unit area in suburban areas than you will in rural areas. It's because, I mean, there's abundant food, uh, there's abundant shelter, and there's fewer predators. And so, um, so they have a huge impact, huge impact. I can't underscore, I mean, it, you know, we talk about fragmentation and we talk, and, and people talk about collecting and and other things, but I, I cannot underscore just how negative of an impact these subsidized predators have on turtle populations, especially spotted turtle. Um, you know, there are there are countless studies that have shown as much as 100% nest mortality, uh, nest failure within the first week uh, of of being of overposition because of raccoons, um, because of skunks. 
And not only that, raccoons are, are one of the few animals that really is capable of making a, you know, of consistently uh, consuming um, turtles. They, they, they have an opposable thumb. They can pull an arm out and then proceed to, you know, chomp down. And so these, these meso predators have a huge, huge impact. Uh, not only on the adults, but also on the on the on on um, on recruitment on actual eggs, and so I there's a, I kind of have a, a hypothesis that that this rabies outbreak that that depleted the the uh, raccoon skunk fox population um, in, in New England and coastal New England, I, I kind of wonder if that might have had a, a a really beneficial impact on on the local turtle populations, especially spotted turtles. Um, and, and you know, the do, the data I have is all is all is, is anecdotal in the sense that it's sort of you know I hate I don't want to fit the data to the hypothesis. That's not that's not that's the worst way to do. You, you can't do that. But um, when I look at the at the age class distribution of, of my of all the animals I've looked at, which I've got over three hundred animals in the different sites that I look at. Um, a vast majority of the animals, well, I shouldn't say the vast, but I, I would say that um, 50 to 60% of my animals, and in some places it's maybe 70%, are 20-ish years or less. I, I have seen, there, there is a ton of recruitment. Um, there, I have a lot of animals that are between, you know, that are hatchling to 15 years old. And so it kind of coincides, interestingly, um with this drop in meso predators um as a result of, of of rabies i don't see nearly as many animals that are you know uh 30 years plus old um and that could just be that you know they, i mean you know that they just haven't lived that long they've been taken out by cars or something else but there's a part of me that just i, I really i, I want to figure a way to try and to try and put that hypothesis to test. I'd have to, that, that's a, that seems daunting. I've been discussing it with some other people and I don't know, maybe one day <laughs> I'll have some enlightenment and figure out a way to test it. But do you see, uh, do you see like the gnaw marks or missing the limbs on the turtles there? Like, I'm sorry? Do you see evidence of attacks from these meso predators on like adult turtles? Are they missing marginal suits or some of them missing limbs? Like, uh, right. Yes, yeah. so, yeah, so that's a great question. So that's a great question. So, um, so do I see uh, um, evidence of of of, uh, of predation attempts? So missing limbs. And the answer is yes, but it's not nearly what I expected it to be. Um, so um, I, I, there's a, a site in Ohio uh, for spot. I haven't done work there. It, it's a, it, but it's a site where I've seen them before. But there's a site in Ohio where there was a study done years ago. I, I want to say it was maybe in the 80s or something. Uh, but I think that they found that 70 to 70, 80 percent of their spotted turtles were missing a limb in that population. Um, so 70 to 80 percent were missing a limb. You find wood turtles where a lot of those populations are missing limbs. Uh, but in the animals that I've been been working with, um, which again it's it's over 300. I, I think it's 300 and 20, 30, something like that, individuals. I only have evidence of missing limbs in, um, in less than 10 animals. So, you know, less than 3% are, are missing limbs. Um, I do have others that show evidence of, you know, chewing around, you know, around the margin of their shell. Um, but that, that, that chewing could potentially be, um, not necessarily, it, it's, there is chewing, you might see gnaw marks around their, the margin of their, of their carapace. Uh, or even sometimes they're plastron, um, that may not necessarily be a depredation attempt. Um, it's possible that that is during, during brumation, um, uh, voles and muskrats will sometimes start chewing on their shells for the calcium in it. And so I've seen a number of marks on them that look like it's actually voles that, cause, um, that are, that are just kind of <laughs> just chewing a calcium block essentially. Um, you know, while the turtles can't really do much. Uh, but yeah, but to answer your question, I, I've seen surprise. That was, I think that's one of the most surprising things I have seen is that, is that, is the shockingly few number uh, of individuals that are, that have missing limbs. Yeah, that actually, that was really, I find that really interesting because uh, uh, one of the more robust populations 
operations around in Delaware. Which I, I'm in Delaware. Uh, it's right by the coast. It's only about 200 yards from the ocean. It's got like dunes, and then it's got salt marshes on the like on the other side of the mm-hmm. ocean, nestled in between the ocean and the uh, salt marsh. And uh, a lot of the turtles there, they look, they look really old. Like they've got really there's no annuli left, and uh, they're obviously they have been worn uh, significantly. But it, a very large percentage are missing one or more limbs, and a seven like it like, looks like something just chomped pieces of their marginals off. Like, just entire entire bones. Of them. And it's it's most it's honestly most of the best. I was, I was surprised to hear that that's, that's not most population Yeah, and that's and, and that's yeah, and like you said, that that's what I was shocked about when I started when I started, you know, kind of monitoring and working with these is I was expecting that. I was expecting I was expecting, you know, at least fifty percent, right? I mean, but when I when I when I have it as little you know, when I have you know, three percent. You know, less than five percent of my animal of the animals I've I've got are showing any evidence of or, or have are missing limbs. That's that's shocking. Yeah, it is it is shocking. And again, it does sort of reinforce. I I, I, I please I'm not try I you know I'm not trying to to you know fit the data to the hypothesis, but um but it it, it does sort of support this reduced um, meso predator uh, population. That, that that um we likely might still have up in new england because of of, of rabies um so yeah i also do see evidence two. of injuries actually i have a file i sent i sent you michael that shows um injury i think that's even labeled injuries um and, and it has a number of individuals that are that are missing limbs uh oh, i'm sorry not missing uh one of them missing two four both of its four limbs um um there's one yeah there's one that's missing but what i'm seeing yeah if you go through some of those images uh you'll see that uh that's the one that's missing both forelimbs and that's the actually the only animal that i've come across the only animal that is missing two limbs um out of all of the 300 plus animals that's the only one that's missing two limbs um uh and he was quite old by the way i mean he had very smooth shell but what i what i've been really shocked with is the, a lot of the evidence I'm seeing of injuries um, is coming from um, what I kind of think might be either um, um, I, I, what I think are maybe uh, uh, lawnmowers or, or, you know, land management activities or getting hit clipped by cars. Some of these injuries are kind of shocking in that um, they were able to survive. There's one image you, you, you showed a little bit. Of, I mean, that one, yeah, the flash round is completely cracked. Uh, but there's there's one that shows um, I mean a giant gash that one right there that I, I can only imagine exposed the the body cavity um, and I, I sort of think that that might have been from a mower so I mean, a lot of these you know a lot of these populations are near I mean you know when they're going to nest that also happens to unfortunately coincide with when people start mowing their lawn you know m- nesting season for these females is you know mid March I'm sorry mid eight mid May until you know sometimes late June or early July, and that's when people start mowing. And so a lot of these 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 uh, injuries, I think, are more from just them coming into contact with mowers um, or cars, but but there but not nearly as many that are evidence of depredation attempts. Also curious to what extent uh, uh, you know the the kind of northeast has had roads going through it for. A long time, and I, I don't know to what extent road mortality is an issue for kind of a, a, a species in, in ephemeral pools and such. But uh, I imagine that they get hit fairly frequently, and maybe there's some sort of selective sort of parsing out of individuals that are a bit more inclined to to wander, and and you have more localized populations just through kind of. I guess just kind of natural selection over time. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I don't know what you think of that, and, and maybe obviously there could be multitude of factors that have led to a more robust sort of coastal population. But yeah, so that's a yeah, that's actually really that's that's a topic I was kind of um, interested in bringing up, but then you beat me to it. So great question. Uh, so um, the question is is you know are is it possible that some of these populations might be some individuals might be showing more site fidelity or or might be prone to having a smaller home range and that they might be selected for in some of these high density areas um and you know these coastal regions 
and it, I think that's, I think it's a possibility. Um, one thing that, you know, I, I want, you know, I, I think it's important to remember is that the, the, the organisms we work with don't read books and they don't read the papers that we are putting out. They don't care about this, the analyses we're doing. And so I can't tell you how many times I've been like, what the hell is this thing doing here? It shouldn't be here or this, these data should not be what they are. This, does this animal not realize it's supposed to move uh, uh, you know, across land for you know, a, a kilometer to get to its nesting? So um, I, I kind of, that's another hypothesis. I don't know how we go about testing, but it does. So first, in terms of road mortality, I haven't seen it as much as I expected, considering the population and considering the density of, 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 of roads and people. Um, so I have not seen road mortality nearly as much as I would have expected, which makes me happy. I hate seeing dead turtles on the road. <laughs> um, and um, so, yeah, so there's that. I, that. I will say one thing that I find um, maybe a bit, I don't, I don't know if that's going to say encouraging, but well, yeah, it's encouraging, um, is that I see on, on wetlands that are immediately adjacent to roads, um, I, it is, I would say, common I, I, in New England uh, to see turtle crossing signs. And um, I am not used to seeing that, really. I, I mean, I, I, can, I can only think of maybe one spot in Ohio and, and other. You don't see it terribly common in other states. But in New England, I, I see... I see a lot of turtle crossing signs and, and I, and I don't know if that's helping necessarily, but I don't see much road mortality as much as I was, would expect to see. Um, I still think it, I would, I would still argue that whatever levels it exists at is still detrimental to the populations. Even if it is relatively low levels, it's still going to be detrimental to the pot to any population. Uh, but as for the other question, the other part of that question, which is, do I think it's possible that, you know, over time that they might have, that individuals that have, you know, uh, that are prone to having smaller home ranges or have higher site fidelity might be, might be selected for. And I think that's possible. I, I genuinely think that is a possible um, um, uh, outcome of just this, this long exposure to humans, to roads, to road mortality and potentially favoring individuals that don't, you know, the females that don't wander 500 meters uh, from the vernal pool and, cr and go into these, these various areas to, to nest. Um, um, I, I don't work with them, but there's, you know, I'm acquainted with a person who does work on Blanding's turtles in Massachusetts. And there's a population uh, that, is, that is in a very suburban area um, it's, you know, this isn't giving anything away, but you know, it's, it's, it's there's a, there are, um, Blanding's range in the state is interestingly around Boston, um, which is, I mean, one of the biggest cities in the, in the country, one of the most densely populated areas in the country. And, and interestingly, Blanding's range is, is in the state is, is around that. And this population that, you know, when I was talking to the person, he, he came in and gave a talk at, at, at my university a, a few years ago. I asked him that question about road mortality and he's been looking at these, I think since the nineties and he has not had, and this, this, this site is completely surrounded by roads. It is, I mean, it, it um, yeah, it is, it's landlocked um, essentially, but he has not had a single animal that has been, that, it, that they've lost to road mortality. And, and Blandings are, are well known for their overland excursions, potentially even more so than spotted. And so he has not seen a single one. And, and, and he actually said the same thing, which was, um, you know, it's, it's, it's possible that these animals are just, that, the one, that these individuals are favored that, you know, only go just outside of the pool that they, that they live in um, uh, to nest. They find, you know, the first suitable site, nesting site that they find, they go, they go to. Um, so I, yeah, I, I think that that's a, I, I think that that is something that, could potentially be in play. Um, you know, they're all different. All individuals are different. And, and some females are just, you know, they are just damn determined to get to that side, to the one side of the road, to that one bank that they like to nest on. Whereas other females are like, eh, 
you know, part of my, you know, screw it. I'm just going to lay my eggs in this sphagnum mound in the middle of a vernal pool because that's the easiest thing for me to do. And, and, you know, and, and I think in the long term, those females might be favored. Um, and I have found a lot of, and a lot of the areas where I find these populations, these, you know, more robust populations, um, I find a lot of uh, nests that are laid actually within the vernal pool. Um, you know, if there's a little, if there's a mound within the vernal pool from a downed tree uh, or, or, you know, a sphagnum mat that's in that pool. I found a number of nests that are actually laid inside the vernal pool on, you know, in a, in a sphagnum mound or a mound of, of sedges. So, yeah, so I think that's, I think it's a possibility. That's interesting. So blandings turtles are an interesting one is sort of a, someone interested in pond turtles. They're pretty closely related, which was sort of counterintuitive for a while. So you've done some work with Atlantic turtles, and maybe you could sort of shed some light on, I think you've seen them in a, a variety of different places, sort of differences in their habitats. And Yeah. Yeah. I So, yeah, I, I got to have a lot of hands-on experience uh, with them when I lived in Nebraska when I was doing my, when I was doing my master's. And, um, and honestly, Blanding's, um, they hold a special place in my, in, in my heart because um, that was, the first, I, I hate to rank her. I, I mean, I hate to rank them and, and play favorites, but you know, and, but it, I mean, when you, when you have a lot of experience with like blandings and spotted and wood turtles, it's really hard for them not to be your favorites. It's just, I mean, it's it just, it's hard. And, um, and so blandings were that first turtle that I found, you know, beyond the, you know, box and, and soft shell painted musk mud snapping. They were the first ones that I found, um, you know, before spotteds and, and, and wood turtles. And so uh, I've got family in Michigan. And even when I was a little kid, seven, eight years old, um, there's some wetlands near near my uncle's place and where there are blanding turtles. And, and I would go out there, you know, he'd, he'd take me out and drop me off at these wetlands um, that, you know, had roads bisecting them. And I would just sit there and watch blanding turtles. And I'd wade through these marches and I'd catch them and I'd, you know, enjoy them and, and, and put them back. <laughs> um, but, um, and then later on, you know, I would, uh, when I was a little older, he would, um, load up a paddleboard, uh, um, onto, onto his car and then drive me out there. And I put the paddleboard in this giant marsh and I just kind of paddle through this marsh and, and get up next to Blanding's turtles and catch them and, and just enjoy them. And I pick my legs up and they'd be completely covered in leeches, which is a small, you know, it's a, small consolation or small, small price to pay for enjoying them. But that was the first turtle that I was like, that I just really was, they really, that was when I found myself traveling to go see, or I should say more appropriately, I had my mom driving me around because I was too, I was, you know, when you're eight to eight to 14, I had my mom driving me to places to try and see. So, um, so, you know, when I went to Michigan, you know, I would, you know, I would get dropped off at these wetlands uh, to see Blandings up there. And then when I would, when I moved to Illinois, you know, I would go to wetlands to look for Blandings. And my mom, my mom even took me to, to Wisconsin to look for Blandings turtles, um, which is pretty awesome. And I did see one um, once there. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so the Blandings is one that I just, it's just near and dear. I've been, you know, it's one I've been, I've been seeing since I was a little kid. And you know, I didn't see my first, I did not see my first spotted turtle in the wild until I was, I think 20, um, 19 or 20. Um, I didn't see my first wood turtle in the wild until I was 24, maybe 23, 24. So, but Blanding's, I saw my first one when I was probably seven years old. And so I've been, you know, it, it, it holds a special place for me. And, um, and I've, you know, I've seen them in Ohio and, and in, and in um, Michigan and Wisconsin and um, Massachusetts and New Hampshire and Nebraska and Iowa. Um, so across their range, which is really, really cool to have seen them from the Atlantic coast. So that, you know, the, you know which I can't say it's the eastern edge of their range, but it's, it's close to the eastern edge of their range to the, to the western edge of their range in Nebraska. And, um, and, and I sent... Um, I've got a file for this as well that I think it's under amidoidia, I think. 
but there's a bunch of pictures in there that show the varying habitats. And so um, that's something that with blandings that I still think is really interesting is just the, the wide range of habitats that you can find them in. Um, you know, everything from, in some areas, roadside ditches, completely artificial roadside ditches. Um, there's one awful picture of me when I was probably around year, maybe actually maybe a few years older than, than you are, Michael. Um, but there, but there's a, of me with one out in Nebraska. Um, so that's actually, yeah, that site, that site and the, well, the one just prior to that, um, to the, it kind of shows an open lake. So, I mean, when you get to the western edge of their range, when you get to Iowa and Nebraska, they're in South Dakota, but just barely. Um, but when you get to Iowa and Nebraska, that's what you find them in. You find them in the prairie, not, you know, not like prairie remnants. You find them in the prairie, um, mixed grass, um, mixed grass prairie. So areas that it, where you find prickly pear cactus and yucca, not a tree in sight. Um, it, you have sand dunes, so they're living, a, they're living alongside yellow mud turtles, ornate box turtles, prairie rattlesnakes, badgers, and they are, they are thriving in these, in these massive uh, prairie pot, this prairie pothole region that's essentially a desert, really, with the exception of these prairie, these spring-fed um, glacial lakes. Um, but then you move farther east, you know, and you find them in, in these and, and, and these mosaics of, um, of, you know, temporary wetlands um, that might be adjacent to permanent wetlands, you know, in Michigan. Um, and then you find them, you know, in Ohio, one of the better places, you know, is what, you know, where you typically find them is, is um, in the, yeah, there's an all, really awful shot that, of, you know, young Mike, but that's, that is Blanding's habitat. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, out in out in Nebraska, and it's just it's crazy to see them in that, and then see them in the next images where it's just in these um, you know woodland vernal pools uh, where they're breeding alongside spotted salamanders and wood frogs. Like yeah, like that image right there, which is from that's that's a site from Ohio um, where there's just a series of these isolated vernal pools that well. Some of them are almost, almost permanent, almost perennial, but for the most part, they're, they're vernal pools, but that's, that is their critical habitat are these, these, I, these very discreet woodland pools. Um, and then you get them in other areas where they are um, living in these, you know, coastal, if you will, marshes adjacent to, to Lake Erie, um, where they're, you know, these just massive expansive cattail marshes um, and for, you know, uh, that are yeah adjacent to one of the Great Lakes, um, and then you get to some other other areas in 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 New York and um, you know a little bit in in Massachusetts and New Hampshire where you find them occupying these uh, swales, these wetlands in between sand dunes, and they just hop from you know from small wetland to small wetland. Um, there's one picture that was on there from Michigan where it showed a Blandings. That was an institute shot of one just walking through the middle of the forest. Um, I was up there um, doing some helping out at a, at a preserve and um, that, yeah, that one right there. I was helping out a preserve in, uh, in Michigan. And um, yeah, and I heard just this loud, you know, clambering up a hill. And I, I wasn't really quite, cause it, it was Mar or early April and I wasn't quite sure what was doing it. And I, it, was a, it was a planting turtle just walking, walking up a hill in the middle of the forest. Um, so yeah, they're they're really cool animals. I, I I I love those guys. They're big goofy faces and their bug eyes and just yeah. They sort of remind me of kind of like a mix between a box turtle and a pond turtle in some ways. Kind of the shell shape is sort of box turtle elongate like, but I don't know, you've got hands on experience. Is that something that's Yeah, they're 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 we yeah they've got that high domed shell um they have that yeah very high domed shell and um which could be kind of box turtle ish and they have and they have a hinge as well they they have a functional hinge um like terrapinae do um not 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 as functional as terrapinae but it is still a it is still a functional hinge 
Um, and, and their limbs are very robust. Um, you know, it, they're clearly an animal that's made for, um, you know, for, for, for moving across land where their body weight's not supported by water um, along, you know, them, them and wood turtles, when you get them in hand, um, you know, a, a, a spotted turtle, they do make large overland movements, um, but they still have a general morphology of an aquatic turtle, like a painted, in terms of the, the, their, their, their limbs and whatnot and their overall morphology. But, but wood and blanding turtles, when you get them in hand and you just see how robust their limbs are, it's kind of, it, it's kind of funny. Uh, they, they, don't, they don't seem like they should really be as aquatic as they are. And in, and, and, in, and, in Bland, and Blandings do typically live in pretty heavily vegetated areas where they're not doing a whole lot of open water swimming. They're kind of just clambering up vegetation and whatnot. But yeah, they're, they are, in, in terms of that kind of similarity to a box turtle, that high dome shell, those, those very robust limbs. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. And they're but big they're a good example. <laughs> Yeah. But they're a good example of where morphology is misleading for classification, just because, like you said, they have a kinetic plastron, but they, but genetically are much more closely related to European pond turtles and Western right. pond turtle. So right. yeah, just kind of a yeah, really fascinating turtle. I I mean maybe they are. so. I, yeah. Yeah, uh, I'm so I'm kind of curious. This is always something uh, I was at the JMIH meeting uh, yesterday. Sort of gave a talk about uh, turtles in Florida Springs, and I like to always kind of hit home on those the presentations about why turtles matter in an ecosystem context. And as sort of a community ecologist, I figure that you'd have sort of a, a an interesting perspective on this. But maybe and and even. I guess pulling from some of your your dissertation work and, and work that you've done in school, uh, what sort of position do turtles sort of? Wh where are they in the environment, and why do they matter in an ecosystem sense? Um, so that's a, that that is a good question, and it and so you know, um, so I, I guess the first part, the first way I'll I'll answer is that um, you know I. I um, maybe I don't say deviate, but I am kind of at, 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 you know at, at, in my heart at least um, I am of the I am of the the camp that any organism, no matter how um, obvious or not or large or small, um, has has intrinsic value, and so just the fact that they're there that that that's to me that is that's all i need is that they have that intrinsic value and i view you know we are we're stewards of the land we don't own it um and with that we're we are tasked with taking care of these things making sure they persist and so i i always like to you know at least start off with saying that they do have that intrinsic value i can tell you you know for 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 those of us who've you know seen them um I'm not sure, michael you said you've seen them before right and I think or no? Have you, no, have you seen I've spotted never. Them? No, no, that uh, never seen a spotted or blanding turtles, just wood turtles. <laughs> okay, and but Jack, you've seen them, right? And I've seen Ken, them have you been? Spotted and wood. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So what I'll say is that there is absolutely no price you can put on seeing one of these animals in the wild. There's just no. I, I, I literally, I am out there. I'm out there multiple times a week in the spring, in my spring field season. And I can genuinely, and I've been doing this for four years. I can genuinely say there's not a single, in the single time I found a spotted turtle where I just, where it becomes just muscle memory. And that's something I think is kind of a shame a little bit is that it was when people work with something so much, they often get a little bit, um, they just get so used to it. It's, it, it they, they've kind of lost some of that excitement, but I still, every single one I find, I, it, it's just, it's burned into my memory. Um, and so, you know, I, I just, I love seeing them still every single, every single one of them. Um, now that said, and that's priceless. Um, now that said, in terms of uh, ecologically where they are, um, there's a number of, a number of things. So first indirectly, um, indirectly, 
Um, there are a lot of organisms that people say, you know, oh, this is a good indicator of ecosystem health. People, people throw that term around or that phrase around uh, really frequently. Oh, this is, you know, this right. is an indicator of ecosystem health. And it, it's so much so that it's like, okay, what can't we use as an, as an, as a indicator of yeah. ecosystem health? Um, that said, I do think herps hold a very special place in, um, and, and kind of almost own uh, that statement for a number of reasons. For one is that they have relatively low agility. They, they, they don't move as much. If, if you know, um, birds and mammals are highly mobile organisms and, um, you know, and, and, and so they can, they can evacuate or colonize a site um, that becomes, you know, uh, amenable or not to their, to them. Um, uh, inverts could also be, could be an indicator of ecosystem health, but at the same time, you know, this is something that, that, uh, a lot of people for one have a hard time identifying invertebrates. So I think that's kind of like when you're looking at aquatic inverts, a lot of them, you know, a dragonfly is not just a dragonfly. It's not just an odonate. And, you know, and so, and, and even if you can get it down to a family level, certain species are very much indicators, but who can identify those species? Um, without getting a dissecting scope. Whereas with herps, it is something that's, that's, you know, comparatively easy to identify. And we, we are, we have a lot of information on their life history, um, across their range. We still need more, we still always need more natural history information. And so where turtles are concerned and where, you know, amphibians and whatnot are concerned, you're looking at an animal that, um, in terms of, an, in terms of a metric of ecosystem, you know, uh, integrity, uh, I hate to say the word health. The word, I, I guess, I, I and I slip and say the word health sometimes. But I, I, I'd rather phrase it in the word of ecosystem integrity, um, because you know, health is a much more. It's it's, it's kind of a, a subjective term, whereas integrity we can look at it from the way of of of, of, of diversity, richness, evenness. We can look at um, we we can quantify the habitat. So we could say that it's you know, um, you know, we ha we have a, an intact system. And so because turtles, especially things like spotted turtles, um, and I love my amphibians. I did most of my, most of my grad work was done on amphibians and salamanders and frogs. And so, yes, they are great indicators of ecosystem health, but where turtles come in um, is that they move a lot <laughs> and they live a long time too. And so if you have an organism, if you have a species that not only lives a long time, but moves a lot and uses a mosaic of habitats from upland woodland corridors to, um, you know, to uh, early successional fields where they nest to, uh, to a, to a, an assemblage of vernal pools that they use for foraging to maybe a small stream where they, where they brewmate. You're looking at an, or you're looking at an organism that really captures, again, the integrity of a system, the connectedness of a system. Um, and that's something that, as, again, I love, and I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to feel guilty. I'm going to have to, you know, write little apology notes to my salamanders. But this is something that, you know, these turtles really do encapsulate better than amphibians. You've got something that can live decades and that uses a lot more, uh, that requires a lot more variable, um, a much more heterogeneous ha um, habitat. Uh, matrix than it did salamanders might, you know, uh, you know, Jefferson salamanders and spotted salamanders, they have their vernal pool, which is their critical habitat. That's where they, that's where they breed and, you know, the larvae develop. And then they have their upland habitat, um, which quite honestly, I mean, yeah, there's, there's going to be variations in it, but they just need that upland habitat. They don't need stream. They don't really, they don't need streams. They don't need rivers. They don't need um, an early successional meadow Turtles do. They need early successional sites. They need corridors that link them to all these sites. And, you know, where spotted turtles are concerned, um, you're going to find them hopping. They're not going, you know, a lot of populations aren't just using one pond. They're using multiple ponds. Um, and they're not, and, they, and the ponds that they might be, you might find them in for three months of the year, that's not where they're brewmating. They might be brewmating in a, in a spring fed stream that's half a kilometer away that otherwise they really don't use very often. So they're, they're able to encapsulate a, a much wider gradient uh, of an ecosystem, the in, how intact an ecosystem is um, than a lot of other organisms are. And because they have that lower, that they have a lower level of agility, you know, as opposed, you know, we all know, 
sadly, turtles aren't good at crossing roads. Um, and and so, you know, it, it, you know, a, a fox, a deer, a, a chipmunk, a squirrel, they can run across roads and, you know, they, they, they can make it. Turtles have a harder time with it. And, um, and so if you have a robust population of something like spotted turtles, it, again, it's a much better indi an indicator of, of an intact ecosystem than you'd get from a lot of other organisms um, that might only use that seasonally or that might only use one habitat type um, in there. Um, the thermoregulatory aspect of turtles is, is again, that is, that's something that shows, you know, you're not going to find a population of spotted turtles in a, you know, that, that is 100% contained uh, within a forest that is completely, you know, covered in, can that has 100% canopy cover and is just one habitat type, essentially. They, they need more than that. Um, and then also just from a, from a community perspective, they're mid-level consumers. And so they do, um, you know, they, they predate on, on, you know, on uh, smaller vertebrates and invertebrates and then other organisms predate on them as well. Um, you know, I, I don't, I don't know that I would say that where, where spotted turtles are concerned, um, that they are, they're a significant, uh, uh, portion of, of, of really any animal's diet. I, I would argue they probably aren't. It, 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 the, at best, they are an incidental, um, um, you know, in, uh, depredation, I guess, but uh, depredation event. But, but I think that they they are important as mid-level consumers, um, and also again as as as, as a as a good metric of, of how intact an, a system is. And I I I think we mentioned this a little bit last night um, when we chatted briefly, which is. You know, with, with regards to movements of my of the turtles I look at, um, I have found um, I want to make sure I get my numbers right because I did a, I did a little bit of looking. Um, so, yeah, so I see the individuals and in the, in the different sites that I've, I'm working at. So interestingly, the site where I that my suburban population um, they use a mosaic they use a stream. That they, I think that they, I, I'm, 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 I believe a number of the population actually uh, overwinters in this stream, and then they move downstream. I'm sorry, upstream rather. They move upstream um, to a series of wetlands uh, that they use for the remainder of the year, and then they move back to the stream, uh, starting in. So it's almost a wood turtle-like movement pattern, but they're using, but they are definitely, you know, they're staying in, in these, in these wet, in these wetlands. Um, but they, they are making the end. I, I'm not doing any, I'm not doing telemetry yet, but I do go out there and, and we're, you know, we're on a weekly basis and, 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 you know, and, and um, with my monitoring and I find that I am frequently finding animals um, moving between two and two and 300 meters from where I caught them a week prior. Um, I see frequent movements of, you know, two to 300 meters from the prior location. Um, and in a couple of other sites, some of my rural sites that I look at, um, I find uh, straight line movements of over a kilometer, which is shocking, um, really. Um, that's straight line distance, not, not taking into account the, the topography of the land and, and, the, and the actual uh, uh, path that they did take, um, which I'm sure is much, much greater than that. Um, it, it makes it confusing when you're, yeah, when you're out there and you're in, one, you're in a vernal pool that's minimum a kilometer from another vernal pool and you find a spotted turtle that you found two weeks ago in one and now it's in another. So they're making these, they're making these movements. And again, they can only do that if you have an intact system um, where they're not going to be crossing roads or whatever. So another very long answer, I think, for what I could have shortened down to a few minutes. That's a very interesting perspective uh, as turtles being a, you know, perhaps more informative, more comprehensive uh, indicator of ecosystem health and amphibians. Um, I do have to leave shortly, you know, to meet up with somebody. But before I leave, I just want to ask you, you know, if you see any competition from red-eared sliders on these turtles, like Blanding's turtle or bog turtles, or, you know, or do they mostly seem to like occupy different niches and, you know, leave each other alone? That's a great, so it was 10, it was, did I say that, I believe? Yeah, right. yeah. Yeah. So um, that, that is actually a great question. So this is something that I think is, is, is really interesting. Um, so to, um, to, to answer it 
before I go down that path, to answer it briefly, I don't see any any competition, any in any interactions between sliders and, and spotted turtles. I, I have not seen a single instance of that at any site. Um, and you actually, I think you answered the question, which is they're occupying different niches largely. Um, and, and that's something that's funny. When you look at spotted turtles and you look at um, a lot of a lot of studies that are trapping them, um, and they're, or they're doing, you know, they're doing a community, a, a turtle community, um, you know, looking at, a, 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 at assemblages of turtle communities. Um, what I have found, because we, we've done trapping as well at my site. Um, and what I found is that if you are catching um, spotted turtle, if you are catching painted turtle or, or snapping turtles or sliders, you're not, you're not in the right habitat. For spotted turtles, um, in general, and, and if you're catching spotted turtles, you're not going to find. You know, you'll find the occasional snapping, the occasional painted, but you're not going to be finding sliders. Um, what I find them in is, is shallow wetlands, highly vegetated wetlands. It really can only be sampled um, from. You know, my sampling starts usually the first week of March. Even in New England, it starts the first week of March. I have a couple of pictures that show show me up and uh, show me with you know, a handful of spotted when the vernal pool that I'm working in is frozen enough that I am able to walk across the entirety of the vernal pool without cracking the ice. And I get to this one spot that's thawed. And there, you know, you'll find a dozen spotted turtles basking in early March. Um, so they are, they, I'm not seeing anything. I, I honestly don't think sliders are going to have much of an impact on them, at least in the areas I've seen. They're just not using the same habitat um, as 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 spotted turtles do. Like I said, when I when I read papers and and I and I look at people who are saying, oh, you know, I think spotted turtles aren't doing well on this site. They only made up, um, you know, five percent of our captures. Um, you know, and I'm seeing the other captures. It's like eighty percent painted turtles, ten percent, you know, twenty percent, or that added up to over a hundred. But you know, if it's like you know huge percentages of painted and snapping turtles um, or sliders. I, I read those. And I'm like, yeah, of course, you're not going to get paint. You're not going to get spotted turtles. You're, you're not in the right habitat. They're using the, the traps they're using to catch spotted tur um, to catch snapping turtles and painted turtles have to be deployed in water. Um, that's, you know, the, the actual opening to those to those spike nets and to those and to those uh, traps. You're in water that's deep and you're in just the wrong habitat type for them. So it's not surprising that they aren't actually um, documenting spotted turtles in these areas, which, may, which leads me to think that there are some areas where they actually might be um, undercounted because of sampling bias. So that, yeah, so that, that to me is always a red flag. When I see, when I see, a, when I see you know, assemblages come out or a paper talking about community assemblages and I see sliders, painteds, and snappings make up the majority, and then I see, you know, uh, spotted that it looks like five percent or two percent. I'm like, well, yeah, of course that's you're not going to. You're you're not. It, that tells me they're not and they're, they're not sampling the right habitat for them. Right. Yeah. That's that's interesting here. Um, Michael Michael has a similar story about pond turtles and radio sliders to share. That I I gotta head out now. It's nice talking to you. He's he's going yeah. to meet with a taxonomist or something to go. So they they have some business to attend to, but. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that it's interesting because the analysis, the analyses I did with the sliders and pond turtles, uh, the sliders do outnumber and an observation ratio is about four to one, which is a bit concerning. Uh, and I, 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 I think that, but when it comes to the impacts of the invasive sliders, I think that typically, uh, uh we're pretty quick to judge and that's, I think not great. I, I think a lot of times we need quantitative data to really back up Absolutely. what's happening. Right. And and it, it's just, it seems to me, um, at least the sliders and pond turtles don't really compete in my area. Uh, I've never really seen, uh, the only competitive interactions I've seen is the pond turtles actually pushing sliders out of areas. They're significantly more aggressive. And um, when it comes to diet and overlap, I don't know, but uh, thinking about sort of, 
sliders at some point, the intraspecific competition between just sliders and the system is going to be great. And at some point, that's going to limit the growth of the population of sliders. And if pond turtles just have a slightly different sort of niche or, or have enough space within the system and food to go around, I, I don't mm. think that even on the scale of decades, there would be impacts. But yeah, that's where modeling comes in. I don't right. really, I don't know. I'm sort of neutral in, until I can really see it that, long term, right? You but, know, I think, yeah. And, and we should always, and we should always kind of um, prefer to not have any non-native species in there. But that said, like you said, we're, we're often very quick to say this is having a negative impact. And technically, you know, the, the, um, the words invasive and non-native mean different things. And so people quickly label something as being invasive when in fact it may not be, it might be non-native. Um, so, you know, invasive would, in, would imply that there are negative, you know, quantified uh, negative impacts on that community that, they, that they've invaded. Um, that would be an invasive species. Whereas other species are, you know, are just simply non-native. They're not necessarily having, a, a, you know, a, a documented negative impact um on the system so i'll give you an example um uh wall lizards podarchus muralis and, and podarchus sicula these are european lizards that were introduced into several cities in the united states uh there's a population of of, of uh italian wall lizards podarchus siculus uh in kansas city there's one in i think long island and then some, there's apparently now one in boston um and then there's the common wall lizard that's introduced into cincinnati um, I think also Vancouver. And the thing is, is, is that, you know, again, people are quick to label these as being invasive, but there's not been shown any real negative impact. When they, when they do gut content analyses of these, they're eating non-native insects. They're eating roaches and they're eating sow bugs and they're eating all these, like all these things that are, they're only, they're eating things that are in, and also, so they're eating things that aren't for the most part native. They're also very clearly restricted to a certain habitat type. Um, I, you know, I, I, this is maybe a little, the, and, and since the, the areas where I find wall lizards in Cincinnati are places where I prefer to go when I have a few more people with me uh, because they're not necessarily right. the, they are very, they're very, you know, and, um, you know, I don't want to be, I don't want to be quite alone in a lot of those areas. They're, they're in urban areas um, and they're using rock walls in people's front yards. Um, I've actually got a picture of uh, Podarchus siculus, the one in the, in the one in, um, in Topeka, Kansas. Um, I've got a picture of it. The only place where I could find those for the most part was in urban and suburban areas. Um, when I say urban, a there was a, there was a, uh, a strip mall and there was a, there was like a chick-fil-a there and like a taco bell and the wall lizards were in literally that green those green grass median in the parking lot and the most the majority of them were by the were by the trash cans um so i've got a picture of a wall lizard basking with a chick-fil-a in the background and a trash can right here and a strip ball behind it and so is that something that i would call invasive absolutely not because it is not it, it's eating non-native organisms there are no native lizards in that area, and there's and same and with the wall lizards in, in Cincinnati, there the, there are native lizards um, in the Cincinnati area. There's there are um, broadhead and five line skinks, but those are in the outskirts and, and restricted to the forested areas. Wall lizards have not shown the ability to really colonize those. So again, I wouldn't I, I would not classify them as, as invasive. We can call them non natives for now. Um, but like you said with the sliders, I think it's, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's important to make sure that we, that, that we apply the proper terms to something, um, uh, you know, when we have the data to support it. Um, and so, yeah, sliders are something that, you know, do they impact painted? That's something I would argue more in favor of, um, do they impact, you know, um, you know, pseudemies? I would argue they, 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 that they certainly could. Um, but in terms of spotted turtles and bog and wood turtles, blandings, I, I, would, I, would, I would need to see data for that.
I would need to see data to, for that one. But yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that, Michael. Right. Okay. Well, we're starting to come up on time. Uh, we'd like to keep it to about an hour and 30, but uh, I guess just for some concluding sort of remarks uh, and maybe a last question in terms of uh, maybe one piece of advice you'd have for someone looking to pursue turtles or just reptile ecology research as a career, what's something that you think is good to know? Oh boy. Um, let's see. There's a number of things. I was things I wish I was told when I was when I was younger, when I was your age. Because <laughs> again, I didn't I yeah, I didn't have any 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 anyone to to, to offer that advice. So uh, one thing I would say is to get involved early and often. Um, get involved early and often. Um, you know, reach out to to your you know to local nature centers. Um, and make sure when you reach out to people, um, make sure that you're reaching out to the appropriate people uh a nature right. center make sure you're reaching out to to the state you know uh, email someone you know your your department of natural resources someone actually affiliated with them and say i'd like to help with some of these things that might you know just just to get some experience so make sure you're contacting the appropriate people so just this is this is i don't want to go under the tangent too much but just because someone has a lot of followers on instagram or on youtube does not mean they actually are experts at that and I've seen that become a rampant problem in, in, the, in the last few years where people are called experts just because they haven't, because they have a million followers and people are like, oh, you, I've had people tell me, and I'm sorry, this might come up a little bit arrogant, but I've had people t tell me I should go and talk to this person who just had, who is, you know, isn't a scientist. They just, they're a, they're a herper and they have like 50,000 followers. And I'm like, I, are you kidding me? Like, do you not, I spent 12 and a half years in college. Like this is, this yeah. is like, this is, this is what I do. Um, so I, so make sure you go to the appropriate people. I would avoid Instagram contact, you know, your, a nature center contact, a state official and try and, and yeah, get involved early and often. If you're in high school, um, obviously you can't get paid for any, I wouldn't assume I, I was, it's li unlikely you'll get any monetary compensation, but you're in high school, look at your parents, you don't need it. Um, so do as much volunteering as you, as you can there. And then with regards to, um, going further, um, look at universities that have good programs in that field. Um, that's something I, I wish I had had a little bit more, um, on like when I went, when I first went to college, this is, I feel like I'm dating myself, but you know, professors didn't have um didn't have lab websites when i first applied to college and uh, so they didn't have and so you didn't have the opportunity to see who was in a, who was at a university necessarily and see what they were working on and who they were working with and what kind of papers they were putting out and so i would say to um kind of look over like you know, it's oh it's, it's a learning process but try and you know see topics that you're interested in and then reach out to professors as you're doing the college application process. Reach out, to, reach out to professors. Reach out to labs um, that seem like they have an active undergrad research program um, with 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 you know with advisors with professors um, who are working on what you want to work with. And then uh, going forward with that, um, make sure you know it is you know I, I, it's something I hate to say, but it's it's. It is the unfortunate truth is it's not always what you know or how much you know, it's who you know. And um, and so that might mean, you know, kind of ingratiating yourself to to the right of the, to the right people. Um, and that might be, a, you know, a state official that might be who knows who. But um, but, uh, you know, making sure you, you making sure you, you keep in track with the right people. Um, and that's something that I don't say lightly. Be, again, be very careful about who you reach out to. Uh, cause, because there are some people it, it, I hate to, you know, and I, I and I, I want to make sure I'm not painting everything with, uh, through rose colored glasses, but there are people out there who, who view younger upcoming people who are really motivated, really excited. Um, they view them as a threat and, and you have to be careful to avoid those people because those, those, those are the ones who can really take something that you, that you love, that you enjoy, that you want to contribute to and they can make it hellish um and then and then yeah that's why i say like getting involved with a professor at a university and from there also 
Um, and this may not be open for everyone, but but look into internships. Um, Parkplace.org, uh, Partners for Amphibian Reptile Conversation, they all, conservation, they always have um, internships posted on their website, always. So look at Parkplace for, for HERP internships, but also um, um, there are a lot of other, a lot of uh, wildlife society, a lot of others po post HERP internships. And don't be afraid to work on something that you don't, that may not be perfectly in line with what you think you want to do. Um, so, you know, be open to, to, to doing different types of projects. Don't, you don't want to pigeonhole yourself, you know, typecast yourself as being a salamander person, a, a, a snake person, a turtle person. Um, and, and the one thing I'll say about internships, so, you know, start looking for those in, in the, you know, in the, in the winter for, you know, some spring and summer internships. But with regards to internships, and this is something that I want to, I also just want to make sure that people who are listening and are interested, um, when you are, when you are outside of high school, when you get to the college level, the university level, and if you, if you are having to like move to a location to do an internship, if you have to relocate there for a summer, um, I'm, I hope I don't get, you know, a target on my head for this, but do not take unpaid internships. Um, that I, if you can avoid, do not take unpaid, um, if you can avoid it, do not take unpaid internships. Um, a lot of places now are, I, I've seen a lot of places that are almost predatory and they're in their, um, and their knowledge that people will do whatever they can to get experience in this field. And, um, and they'll, and they will have an unpaid internship that requires you to relocate to a place for the summer. Um, they might, maybe they'll cover housing, but they won't pay for your actual time and work. That's just, I'm sorry, but we can do better than that. I've, you know, I, um, I've been in the, in the position of both that, you know, someone who's looking for an internship, but also someone who's, who was giving them. And, and if you want, you can get money for your workers. You should get money for your workers. Um, and, and the people who aren't doing that quite honestly, aren't, I, I would, I would be concerned how well they would treat you. And, and, you know, it's, yeah. So I would say avoid unpaid internships like the plague. Um, it, it's just, it's not worth it. You're, you're worth more than that. Y you and your time, your work is worth more than that. Um, and it looks better on a CV too. It looks better on a CV to say that it was a paid, you know, that this was a paid position because that's also saying that this place valued enough, valued your work enough to hire you as opposed to, you know, if it's an unpaid internship, then it, it might just be like, oh, well, this person just took whoever they could get because no one else applied. So um, that is, that's what I would say. It would be an important thing to do. Um, hopefully that was somewhat, went in a somewhat logical progression from, you know, high school on. Um, so, and, and be prepared, be prepared for a lot of dear John <laughs> or, or, or dear Jane emails. Oh, we're sorry. You're not, you know, we found someone else. Be prepared for that. Um, steal yourself against it. Um, but yeah, it, it'll, it, it'll work out. I, I, I've seen few people who really were motivated, who really were motivated and loved this area that didn't find their niche if they put, you know, put the work into it, put the effort into it. Um, if you love what you do, people can see it um, and they, and they appreciate it. So. I think that was some great advice. I mean, it just like uh, the whole progression of it and, and uh, just it's constantly an evolving process. Like you're never really done networking, I feel like. And it's just, no. uh, but yeah, getting started. And it's that's hard sort for of but yeah, no, network I mean, to network. Too. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Well, we, we like to finish up with a little uh, just kind of fun um like trivia, I forgot to tell you this, but and I, no problem if you don't have anything prepared. But I don't know if you've got a few, uh, maybe two or three turtle related trivia questions. Uh, we tend to do this at the end of all the episodes, just kind of for fun. And and you kind of just ask us and, and we try to come up with the answer. But it's just a fun way to oh, bring in obscure turtle facts. All right. 
Uh, but I, yeah, I hate to put you on the spot. Normally, I do this beforehand, but I just I forgot this time. But um, actually, okay, here, here, I'll I'll, I'll give some that, that might help people who um, who might see some spot, might see some turtles. So uh, let me think. Can you list? Um, yeah, can you list? Uh, I guess five. Uh, aspects of sexual dimorphism in spotted turtles. Okay, uh, I could <laughs> go with one. I Jack will probably notice for these, but I would say shell height for females is going to be more domed overall. Typically, yes. Typically, females have a more have a higher dome shell. So you got one. Oops, I think. Jack muted, maybe. Uh, uh oh, he's mute. We can't hear him. I think his connection is. Yeah, he's muted. Maybe he tried rejoining. <laughs> well, I, okay. While he's, yeah, while he's doing that, uh, tail length is typically males yeah. have longer yeah, tail, females shorter. Uh, he he was gonna say something, and he's got more experience with these than me. Um, trying to think. Well, for pond turtles, this is probably kind of a, a, I don't know if this would be the case with spotters, but the fe I've noticed with female pond turtles, they kind of have more of a rounded, like, anterior region to the, the head, and the males are a bit sharper. But, uh, yeah, that's probably that, not really that's prob actually, no, that's probably I hadn't I actually hadn't thought of that one. Um, that That is, at least just anecdotally, running through my head of all the females and males. Yeah, the females do tend to have a bit... A bit more of a rounded head, I would say. Um, okay. How about that's a sort of a sixth, I guess. So yeah, that would maybe be a sixth one. Okay, maybe uh, just thinking about morphometric things like plastron length, maybe is a bit longer in females than um, it is in males. Maybe it doesn't vary much. So think more just like maybe thinking more just along the lines of, of like if you're just a casual observer and you find a spotted turtle and you haven't and you don't have anything to, to compare it to, what would the you know? Okay. So he's kind of he's back now. Can we? Alrighty. Uh, so yeah. Uh, what I can you hear me now? Yes. Well, we've got tail length, shell height, and sort of Founded face shape. Uh -oh. Does he get the plastic? What was that? Um, he can maybe maybe could he type on there and I could just read him out if he types. Yeah. yeah so yeah, yeah do that you want to type? Um, would be the pl the concavity of the plastron. Males have a very very go. noted uh, plastron concavity for spotted turtles. Very, very notable. Um, females, it's just flat. It is, it, it, it's not even slightly convex um, on the females, whereas on males, it is, it is, a, it is very concave. All right. So there's, um, so then, so I guess maybe two more kind of since you got, since the one you mentioned on the kind of rounded head, yeah, I, I would, I would, I would buy that. Um, but there, the, the, other, the last two are ones that a, a casual observer could see them and they could quickly um, um, identify the sex of an individual. I can see, I, mm. I, this allows me to, to ID spotted turtles from, you know, 100 feet away some, if I, or, or more if I have binoculars. Um, so one of them is the eye color. Male's eyes are, are brown. Um, they are they are typically a, a brown coloration, um, and whereas female spotted turtles, their eyes are orange. Um, they're really quite pretty. They're striking. Um, it's kind of like a reverse box turtle. You know, in box turtles, you have the males have the red yeah, eyes, right. and the orange eyes, and females have the brown. In spotted, it's the opposite. The female, the males have kind of a brownish eye. Females have a, a, a nice orange uh, or yellow eye. Um, and then the other one, th this this is probably more that's probably more helpful is that um the chin the, uh of the the um right. the ventral portion for the chin of male spot is, is almost always brown or even black um so they have a very dark so they're very dark features the males when you look at their head you see dark eyes you see a dark chin you know brown chin 
whereas females, uh, their chins are usually orange, um, orange to yellow. And so when you see a female, you know, even from a distance, if you can see a kind of a brightly colored chin and eye, you, you can be pretty much guaranteed you have a female. So that's way if you're just a casual person and you find one, um, you know, if it's got, if it has orange eyes, orange chin, flat plastron, relatively short tail, relatively high dome shell, 100% female. If it's kind of a dark, if it's a very dark individual, it's going to be a male. So. The pond turtles even have that sort of chin coloration difference. Uh, not as much oh, between they? the sexes. But yeah, between the, the subspecies, it's not 100%, but. The northern ones typically have more of a contrasting lighter chin and the south southern pond turtles it's typically less of a contrast kind of just beige all around or mottled but that's cool yeah that uh, well that that's a great question kind of like five pronged that's uh cool stuff but yeah. uh i mean yeah i think we're sort of coming to the the close here but it's been really a, a pleasure talking with you dr graciano uh really appreciate you coming on and uh, definitely sort of interesting to hear your perspective as in a community ecologist and putting things kind of in perspective, uh, but just also your experience and the work you're doing is really cool. Looking forward to sort of following that uh, over the, the, the years and seeing what you find. But Thank yeah, you. thanks and for I've, coming on. Yeah, it's been fun. I, yeah, I, I had a lot of fun. I, I, I usually teach during, I, 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 I am teaching, you know, in the fall and spring semesters and some, so this is kind of, this is, uh, and during the summer, I, I really just kind of have it off. And so this is kind of, this is, this is familiar to me. It's, you know, having, <laughs> having people that, to, to, to chat with. So this is, this has been good for me as well. Um, and that, yeah, I enjoyed it. I always like sharing, sharing my perspectives and whatever I can bring to the table. So. Well, we, we really appreciate it. Jack, I don't know if you've got some final words here. I don't trust my audio. You do cover it pretty well. So, uh, yeah. Thanks for coming on. It's been really a, it's been a productive conversation. Yeah, no problem. No problem. All right. And well, you, for all the And Michael, if you want to change, if, if you want to change, you know, having seen, uh, seeing spotted turtles or Jack, yeah, you're welcome to come up to, to New England. So, well, I appreciate that. Up there. Um, by the way, just real quick, Massachusetts is um, one of the only states that has that has um, it has Blandings, bog, wood, spotted, and box turtles up there, which is a pretty cool assemblage, and terrapins and diamondback terrapins. So that's a pretty neat assemblage to have. Not many not many states can boast can boast that. So I'm only uh, I'm like six hours south. I'm so I'm, I'm like I'm in Delaware, so it's like. Five and a half, six hour drive north to where it gets to Nice, nice. Not too far. Yeah. <laughs> All right. For the for the listeners out there, uh, you can find us at the turtleroom.org slash colonia cast. Make sure to check out the student research fund that we've got going. I uh, really appreciate all the donations we've been receiving on there. And uh, we will see you next week.